Today's program is presented to you by the program in Forensic Psychology. The lecture is Behavioral Aspects of Active Fillers with Dr. Gregory Becky. Everybody, thank you for uh, coming to the webinar. Um, probably the next half hour or so, we're going to cover um, a few things that is near and dear to my heart based on my background, and that is uh, active shooters. Um, and I call active shooters because, or active killers, because we're in we're going to talk about both, you know, shooters and not everybody uses a gun, but essentially the same type of behavior. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Greg Becky. Um, I'm actually a, uh, an alumni, a graduate from Nova Southeastern University. I got my Ph.D. in 2006 in conflict analysis and resolution. Um, I spent about 29 years um, in all couple areas of government, the U.S. Army and uh, mostly in the FBI. Um, investigating uh, a lot of violent crime, organized crime, Russian organized crime, drugs, terrorism, um, Indian country crime, and things like that. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I kind of focused on while I was in the FBI was, um, was behavioral science. I was in charge of the behavioral science unit in Quantico. I was a unit chief uh, for a number of years and also um, pretty much was a hostage negotiator throughout my entire career. And so um, all my stuff is pretty much behavior-based, both verbal, nonverbal, and it's what I'm absolutely passionate about. So, so we're going to kind of talk today um, a little bit about that, how it relates to active killers. Okay. Now, one of the things that you keep in mind when you're responding uh, to these type of events, talking about the police, the government, first responders, firemen, um, anyone that's going to respond to it, is that we follow essentially the emergency management cycle. Uh, the emergency management cycle, uh, which is used by agencies, um, involves essentially four things. Now, what I have on the screen here is I've actually got one, two, three, four, five, six things. The typical emergency management cycle deals with the last four, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And when you think of active killers, you think of active shooters, you think of you know hostage situations, you think of you know serial crime, you think of all these different things. You know, everybody's always focused on the response. You know, what do you do? How do you enter? How do you you know how do you pin the guy? How do you triage? How do you do all this stuff? And there's a lot of information, a lot of research, a lot of training on you know what to do once the shooter um, pulls the trigger or once the active killer you know, starts chasing your body with a knife. And so what this presentation is not about is it's not about how to respond to this. Um, there's enough expertise out there and enough things going on where they do a really good job of, of responding to it. My point is, is that I like to think about things in terms of backing it up and getting in front of the problem, and that's talking about um, prediction prevention. And so in order to even have a discussion on that, we do have to have an understanding of, um, of the psychology, the motivation, the behavior, um, all the stuff that, that, that goes into these type of offenders. And believe it or not, as, as, as we're going to go through here, we're going to come up with some, um, some ideas um, and things that work in order to try to either predict or prevent this uh, versus just waiting until it happens. Because once as I'm sure many of you know, once a person kicks in the door and starts shooting, even the fastest response by the police is not going to be fast enough. You're going to have a lot of people die and get injured and get hurt and essentially be traumatized for the rest of their life. So the focus of this presentation, and kind of my, my, my background and focus, is always on prediction prevention. You know, what can we do to get in front of the problem instead of waiting until after the problem happens? So in this case, we're going to be looking at things um, that are in common with these type of offenders. Okay? And that's kind of where, where the focus is on this presentation. Now, some of my discussion points um, are going to be, um, we're going to talk about types of offenders very briefly, targeted violence, um, some myths that you may not know about re regarding active killers, some common motives, some pre-attack behaviors, threat assessment, and, um, and, and of course the, 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 the main thing, um, that's going to pull everything together is this uh, behavioral uh, predictive analysis. Okay. 
So types of offenders. First off, we have to make a distinction that there are essentially, when you're talking about active killers, active shooters, we're talking about essentially three types of offenders. What I mean by that is, is what motivates them to um, do, do the crimes or do the, the actions and the behaviors that they do. Okay? The first one are terrorist-motivated offenders. Okay? Those are going to be um, uh, things like what we saw in San Bernito, California last year, what we saw at um, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, and things even you know, across uh, other areas of the world, such as the, um, the Beslan um, uh, Russian uh, shooting attacks and killings and things like that. That's your terrorist-motivated terrorist offenders. Okay? Now, what we're going to talk about today includes that, so, but I wanted to make sure that we understood exactly what we were talking about in terms of, of this type of offender. The other type of offender, which we're not going to spend any time on, but just so you know as far as definitions, is your, is your criminal-motivated offender. These folks are shooting people up or, you know, doing things because they have a profit motive, they want, to, they want money, it's uh, essentially criminal or selfish interest, um, versus the previous one, which is a terrorist-motivated offender, they're doing it for a cause. Now, what I want to get to is the grievance-motivated offender, and that is that's what we're going to talk about today. This excludes the other two offenders because this type of predictive um, behavior analysis um, approach that I'm going to be talking about simply will not work with the other two offenders because there's no way to develop a, uh, a real-time baseline uh, in terms of their behavior. Um, however, the good news is, is that, well, kind of good, kind of bad news is, is that nearly all of the school shootings and nearly all the workplace violence shootings that we see here in the United States and even abroad comes from the standpoint that their main, motiva their main motivation for shooting, for killing, for stabbing, for running people over, for hitting people with machetes and hammers and everything else that they do is because of grievance. They feel that someone wronged them. They feel that, that, that someone or an organization or maybe both um, re uh, basically um, uh, did them wrong. And so this is the, the, the motivation. And of course, in dealing with any type of you know, behavioral analysis or assessment, uh, rather it's verbal, nonverbal, even in hostage negotiation, in order to be effective against these folks, you have to understand their motivation and where they're coming from. And that includes their values, what's important to them, why they're doing it. We always want to figure out the how and the why on this. Okay? Most people focus on the who, what, where, and when. I'm interested in the how and the especially the why. And, that's, and, and in order to um, be effective in more than just flipping a coin uh, in terms of, of analysis, um, we want to we want to uh, really under, truly understand the motivation. Let me get my watch out here so I can keep my time here going good. Okay. All right. So targeted violence. What we're dealing with here in these active killers is essentially targeted violence. And targeted violence is essentially um, something that is considered, it's planned, and it's prepared for. This isn't something that just happens overnight or, or it, it, it happens quickly. As we're going to learn, there is a lot that goes into this over a fairly long period of time that gives us a huge opportunity to get in front of this problem. Now, as far as method of attacks, again, I touched on the fact that I'm calling this an active killer um, presentation versus an active shooter. Now, the shooters obviously are much more prevalent in the United States. However, outside the United States, not so much because the guns aren't quite as, um, as easy to get. But we do account for here that mostly firearms account for most of these type of um, events here in the United States, um, followed by knives and, and a couple of, uh, of other um, uh, less used type of weapons, okay, to include hands and feet. Um, another risk factor that we see is bombs. Pipe bombs, IEDs, VBIEDs, which is a vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices, things like this, where, they're, where they're, they're adding that to the gun or the rifle or, you know, whatever, whatever the, the primary weapon is. Um, we've seen this going all the way back to Columbine. Um, you know, they, uh, the, the, the two offenders in, in that case, uh, back in, I think it was 99, um, had pipe bombs. Now, luckily, unfortunately, they didn't go off, but the bomb 
or the idea of a of some sort of a bomb um, seems to be fairly prevalent in the planning process. So we have to kind of keep in mind that um, not only are we looking for you know guns and shooting and other things, but also bombs. Um, here's just some examples here. Um, in this in this case, um, this subject uh, used a uh, machete. In this uh, example, uh, Mohammed Reza used um, at Chapel Hill, North Carolina, used a car. They tried to run him over. So you got machetes, you got knives, you got carves, uh, cars. But again, we're talking about the same the same basic motivation uh, being grievance. Here's what a statement that um, that he that he made. He said, "I did intend to use a handgun, but the process of getting a handgun was basically tough." So what did he do? He got a car, tried to run everybody over. So even though uh, he tried to get a gun, couldn't get a gun, still had the problem. He just used a different type of weapon. Some myths that, we, that, um, that are often um, associated with active killer um, uh, events. First off, people think that they're everywhere. And frankly, they're not. They actually don't happen that often. Now, not to mean that it's not a high-impact situation that we have to be worried, worried about and also... Um, prepared for, but the fact is, is that it doesn't happen all that often. In fact, since, you know, between 93 and 2009, homicides actually decreased in the workplace. Um, part of that was due to target hardening. What I mean by target hardening is things like uh, metal detectors and locks and um, security guards and, and things like this. Um, also, campus crime uh, is not is really not all that uh, that bad in, in terms of statistics. You know, we're looking at homicide rate in the U.S. Um, maybe 5.5, 5.6 per hundred thousand in campuses is 0.53 per hundred thousand. Okay. We also, um, oops, what did I do here? The wrong way. Sorry, guys. Lost my place here. Sorry. There we go. Okay. So on campus crime, we had um, you know after. Um, Sandy Hook, there was a, uh, a move uh, by Cleary to go ahead and look at campus crime and have it reported officially through, through all um, higher education um, universities. And here's kind of the breakdown. And again, um, kind of follows the, the myth you know, that they're everywhere. They're really not everywhere. In fact, campus crime, you're looking at negligent uh, manslaughter being 0.02% and manslaughter being 0.007% um, and murder. So it's, it's pretty low, but again, it's high impact. But this, this, this theory or this thought that it's everywhere simply is not true. The other thing is um, that we talk about is that most of the killers are disgruntled students or employees, and that's all you've got to worry about. And that's simply not true either. Um, although there are disgruntled employees that carry out these attacks, as well as disgruntled students, people that are bullied, feeling that you know they're upset because they didn't get, get, didn't get a good grade or, or whatever the reason is, um, uh, there, there is more threat to safety. In fact, um, many of these instances, especially workplace violence, have to do with uh, personal acquaintances. 4% uh, for uh, males and about 28% for, uh, for females um, are not by coworkers or disgruntled employees, but actually people outside of there um, that do them very well. So we have actually multiple threats when we're talking about this. Not only the students and the employees, we've got parents and we have um, a number of different types of outsiders that um, cause this um, to be an issue. So again, you know, when we're when we're looking at this, we want to make sure that that we're looking at everything, um, not just assuming that it's disgruntled employees or whatever. Okay. Um, the other thing, and this is probably the one that that causes um, the most problem, and people even you know trying to get in front of this problem, is that there's an assumption that that this just happens. That it it they just snapped. It's just like all of a sudden, you know, I get upset and. Now I'm just going to pull a gun and start shooting everybody. Okay, it doesn't happen that way. Almost never happens that way, and um, and the reason is is because there is a pathway to violence, and the pathway happens over time. You have to remember that when someone goes into crisis, they feel like they're grieved, right? Okay, and they no one likes to feel grieved because grieving then you know a grievance then leads leads to um, uh, being upset, being angry. It leads to conflict. It leads to 
that you know they, they, they can't have this huge problem they can't fix. And so over time what happens is that the, if, if the person who's experiencing the grievance feels that they can't cope with it anymore, they tried to, 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 to fix it, and they feel that no one's there to help them, and they're kind of up against a, a, a wall as far as this goes, then we start the pathway to violence. And the pathway to violence starts out with the grievance. So someone feels that either someone in the organization, the school, the workplace, or the organization itself, or both, has uh, treated them wrong. And then usually they make some sort of effort to fix that grievance, and for whatever reason, they fail to be able to, to bring that to a conclusion, okay? And then they start to think about, okay, well, how am I going to fix it myself? So the ideation, the violence, the ideation. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and kill Mr. Smith, right? I'm going to take, I'm going to take him out. So the ideation comes in. So then they start research and planning. And, of course, there's plenty of stuff on the Internet. There's plenty of stuff out there, which we call visual bridges, that can give them essentially the recipe to do these type of shootings. They're almost like a how-to thing because previous shooters and previous um, other people have put things up on social media that will actually provide them with the information that they need in order to um, further their, their planning. Then after that comes some sort of preparation. Preparation is going to be they're going to find some sort of weapon. They're going, to, they're, going to, they're going to choose the right day to do it. They're going to choose the right time to do it. Um, then there's the actual breach, which comes, you know, uh, where they um, actually enter it, and then the attack. And so the problem is, is that most of us, or most people, don't have any idea that one through five is going on, so all we see is the attack, so therefore we think it's a snap effect. We think, oh, man, the guy just snapped, and we didn't see that coming. Whereas if we actually pay close attention, there's a lot of indicators. For example, Stephen Kazmerzak, who was the um, shooter in the uh, Northern Indiana University, okay, he had a recent loss and humiliation. Okay, that was his grievance, and and that happened months before the attack. Um, he got involved in reckless sexual encounters, weapon acquisition. These are weeks before the attack. Excessive spending. Uh, he got off drugs. Uh, this is part of the stuff we're going to talk about in just a second. He sought the privacy of a motel for a staging area. He, he, he organized his backpack, the, the magazines he filled with, uh, with ammunition two days before the attack. And then finally, you know, he made the decision um, at the time and date of his choosing to go in and, and commit the attacks. And so what happens on this is that we have, you know, time. There's time... Um, that where this where the where we go through this pathway of violence from you know, one to six that takes you know days months weeks oftentimes even longer even even up to, to years where they're trying to, to fix the grievance they can't fix the grievance and then they resort to to this there's another guy another example here this guy named Jivali Wong um, American Civic Association uh, he went in there and shot shot that place up his um, he he was a um, um, he, he was from, I think from, I forget where he's from, he's from one of the Asian countries. He came over expecting the American dream, didn't work out, he was poor, he became grieved over that. Um, so his humiliation and loss happened months uh, before the attack. He got weapon acquisition weeks before the attack. He got body armor weeks before the attack. Except suspending tattoos, joined a gym, all this other behaviors and things all weeks before the attack as part of his preparation. Um, he left a legacy token, which we'll talk about in a second, um, a few days or weeks before the attack, and then increased isolation days before the attack until finally he um, uh, blocked a, a back door and then went in the front door and um, started shooting. So the point is, is that there is no snap effect for um, active killers. The other thing is, um, is that there's also a common co uh, belief that revenge is the actual motive. Well, actually, revenge is actually a symptom of the grievance. So what happens is the grievance happens, they can't deal with it, they can't fix it, they become angry, they become emotional, they get into crisis, and then they want to they um, uh, go after whoever it is, and then the revenge becomes a, a symptom of that. But it's not really revenge, it's about grievance. Some reasons, some commonalities. Now, these are just some commonalities that you'll see in a lot of them. 
grievance is almost in every single one of them, and that's that's really the key focus. That we're, that if you're going to do any sort of accurate behavioral analysis, you need to know that it's a grievance because that's the most common thing, common motive um, through everything. But some other commonalities that you'll see is anger, the perception of being persecuted, uh, uh, mental illness, personality disorders, um, looking for a loss. Okay, like the double whammy, a loss in a relationship, in their personal life, and maybe a loss in their professional life, like maybe getting let go, being demoted, not getting a promotion, things like that. They also, want to, they also want to make some sort of preemptive strike, and that's what starts that pathway to violence, because they want to get back, they want to fix the grievance, and the only thing they can do that they can think of is to try and shoot, um, or, to, or to do some sort of, um, um, you know, uh, active, active killing type of behavior. Um, they externalize blame. Um, they magnify. They they are very uh, they're very um, hypersensitive in terms of being you know blame. They externalize blame, and uh, like I said, many of them have um, uh, either history or evidence of mental disorders. Some of the pre-attack indicators: um, leakage, weapons acquisition, cleansing and purifying, extreme recklessness, legacy tokens. Um, and um, staging areas are common pre-attack indicators that once we have an idea of someone who might be an active shooter or might be an active killer, we can start looking for evidence. So we can start um, uh, connecting the dots, so to speak. Okay? Leakage is doing things like um, letting people kind of know what you're going to do. All right? in, in this set of slides here, this is from um, some social media um, from a guy named Jeffrey. And if you look through here, you'll see um, this is kind of his, his personals, um, his name, marital status, location. Now, the location, endless scrutiny in Minnesota, United States, occupation, doormat. Okay, so kind of gives you a little bit of insight. Um, his interests, military, high schools, death and dying. 16 years of accumulated rage, suppressed by nothing more than brief glimpses of hope, uh, which have all but faded to black. Um, I feel the urges within slipping through the cracks, the leash I can no longer hold. Uh, favorite things, moments where control becomes completely unattainable. Um, hobbies and interests, planning, waiting, hating. Um, but one thing I do want to say is that, so this is an example of leakage. Okay? Leakage is something that happens where, you know, there's indicators out there that if you pay attention, might give you a clue as to who might be having an issue, who might be grieved, who might be having a problem. And again, remember, it's the grievance that counts here. And if somehow we can keep in mind that when you're trying to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to get in front of this problem, we're trying to identify the person with the grievance before he resorts to violence and then help him deal with that grievance. Because once we can take care of the grievance, there's no longer a motivation to kill. And that's kind of the process that we're using here. Now, one thing to keep in mind on the leakage, especially in this example, is that you have to look at it in context. Okay? There are many kids out there that would just put this up here because they like to they like to get people's attention. They like to you know they like to make people you know get get attention. They're they're trying to make a statement. They're trying to be tough. They're trying to be cool. They're trying to be goth. They're trying to be whatever they're trying to be. Right. So you have to take this with a grain of salt. That just the fact that this is up there. It doesn't mean he's going to be a shooter, and it doesn't even mean he has a grievance. It could be just the way just the way he is. So if we happen. So the key is, if we happen to know his baseline behavior, that this is just the way he is, then this is no issue. However, if his baseline behavior showed that that it was uh, very very different than this type of stuff, then this type of of activity online would be considered potential leakage, and this would be worthy of looking into further. Weapons acquisition is another common thing that they all do. You know, they've got to get the weapons. So maybe they go to dad and mom. Um, uh, maybe they, they, they get it because they steal it. Maybe they get it, uh, they go buy it themselves. If they're old enough, they, they can get it legally. Um, they get a weapon of some sort. If they can't find the one that they want, such as, such as a gun, they might resort to knives, cars, or other, uh, or other types of, um, 
weapons. So there's going to be some behavior, some attempt to gain access to weapons, and that usually, again, uh, on you're looking at the baseline of the behavior, we want to go ahead and do that with the weapons acquisition and look at it. Okay, is this unusual or not? Sometimes, um, oftentimes, they'll do cleansing and pur purifying. If you're on drugs and alcohol, they get off of it, or if they're not on drugs and alcohol, they get on drugs or alcohol. So it kind of works both ways. Extreme recklessness is, is very, very um, common. Uh, uh, running up credit cards, um, uh, sexual indiscretions, uh, and a total disregard for future consequences. The other thing is legacy tokens, and these are things that they want to leave behind for people to have. These are also the things that are available on the internet that serve as the visual bridge to give people ideas to, uh, on how to go about carrying out a shooting because they're not exactly sure how to do it. A legacy token can be things like photographs, notes, um, anything that the, that, the, that the killer leaves behind, maybe to let the world know why they did it, um, you know, and that's and typically to justify their, their grievance. So Jeverly Wong, who I spoke, spoke about uh, previously, he left uh, sent photos of himself with the guns to the um, local media, local news station, as well as a letter detailing why he did it, his grievances, and things like this. Okay. Also, a staging area is very, very common where just the night before, a couple days before the attack, they'll maybe check into a hotel, motel, they kind of gather them, uh, gather them uh, their thoughts, um, uh, you know, prepare, uh, load, their, load the magazines, um, kind of get their head, head right for the attack before they go ahead and they, um, they do the actual um, breach. Okay? Um, some of the additional pre-attack uh, indicators are uh, fascination with previous attacks, viewing of violent scenes, historical factors, suicidal attempts, clinical factors, conventional and, conven and uh, contextual factors. So an example of a uh, fascination with previous attacks, this is the, uh, the photograph of Norris Hall, uh, which is the hall that, the, uh, that Cho went into in the Virginia Tech shooting when he shot up everybody and, uh, after he killed the first two people. Um, viewing the violent scenes, this again is used a lot of times as a visual bridge. They'll look at this to kind of get ideas of how best to carry out the attack so they can be successful. Historical factors, um, uh, prior suicide attempts, uh, you know, juvenile detention, things that might tie in as well as suicide attempts. Uh, in the case here, uh, Kazmierczyk here attempted all these suicide gestures from 1996 to 2008. So again, just some other indicators um, uh, that's common among these, uh, these killers. Uh, clinical factors, as I mentioned before, many have uh, psychopathological disorders, mood disorders, personality disorders, mental illness, things like that. And of course, contextual factors, um, uh, problems with uh, people that are close to them, um, uh, uh, violence against caregivers, violence against uh, people that are close to them. Um, and things like that. Um, also, watching movies, for example. Um, Steve uh, Kamerzak, the guy who did the uh, Northern Illinois, he was into Saw 4, which was one of those, um, you know, those, you know, cut them up movies. Uh, and a guy named Gizmo, which is the picture on his arm, um, that is the bad guy in the movie. And he's, and he's kind of like a serial killer, right? So he really liked this. He also found out, uh, and he likes... Uh, Gizmo, and of course Gizmo then had this uh, uh, this picture of the hammer, and then he got that idea from Cho, okay, who actually was the Virginia Tech uh, shooter, happened before him, and Cho was into a uh, movie called Old Old Boy, which is kind of like a slasher movie, and he kind of uh, liked that guy. So it's kind of interesting that you have these contextual factors of looking at previous, you know, shooters of, of, uh, of like mind and who you want to kind of be like, right? Uh, Cho, uh, the Virginia Tech has been one of the most copied ones as far as um, encouraging uh, potential active killers. They, go, they, they study that as well as Columbine, okay? Now, a couple of things here is threat assessment. Before I finish up here, a couple of things on threat assessment is that threat assessment has to, be, has to do with um, has to do with prevention, and remember that out of all the stuff I have listed here, it's really a no one-size-fits-all. You have to tailor the threat assessment to the specific area uh, 
such as a school, specific university, because each one has their own, uh, uh, their own individual organizational culture that you have to take into consideration. Okay? Um, things about threat assessment, it needs to be proactive. Um, you've got to have strategies that contribute to, that, to the identification and disruption of targeted violence, okay, which we talked about earlier. Um, you need trained professionals to be involved in this. And you want a collaboration, and this is the key to the prediction piece, a collaboration of all the people that are involved in the person's life uh, so that we can build a behavioral baseline so that way we can look at anomalies to figure out more than a coin flip as to whether or not this person you know, may have a grievance and may be planning to commit violence. So then we can intervene with that person. Okay. Now, one of the... Uh, the other thing is, is that you know we we're talking about profiling, and um, there is no one profile for an active shooter. The fact that you have an eyeball looking at you, this eyeball says nothing. There's no way you can look at this eye and be able to tell me if this person's a shooter. Um, you're not even sure if it's female or male. It kind of looks female, but do we really know? The answer is no. We want to get away from guessing, demographic profiling. We want to be able to do it based on behavioral signatures, and we want to do it based on. Um, uh, things that can tie it directly to a group or a person. Okay? For example, Brenda Spencer, one of the active shooters, um, back in 1979, was a female. Very unusual. Okay? Most of them, high, high majority of them are male. So you can't always profile, that every, for example, that everybody's going to be a male. You can look at it from the standpoint of stats, but you can't look at it from the standpoint of assessment or analysis or, or, or for some sort of a profile. So, Here's the predatory behaviors. You got the personal grievance, and you look for contextually inappropriate things, things that are different, things that that they don't usually do, such as interest in weapons. Um, they're target practicing. They're talking bad about Mr. Jones. They're talking about guns. They get the anarchist uh, handbook. They're looking at gun magazines. Um, there's a they're they're all of a sudden um, uh, more in. They're more uh, Less expressive than they are than they uh, than they usually are. Um, they're they're late for class. They're, they become truant. They become um, quiet. You know things that are different, and that's the things that we're looking at. So we have to look at it in context. In in context is what's normal for that person. Okay. So what I want to get to here is in predictive behavioral analysis. What we're looking at is we're constructing a a, a profile. But it's not a general profile, a specific one, where we can actually use it to identify someone who might be thinking about becoming an active killer. Because again, there's a process. It does, there's no snap effect on this. And so we're looking at two things, behavioral signatures, which is something that we can tie directly to a person, not just generally to the population, but directly to a person. And then you know, the modus operandi, which is what's needed to complete the crime. So we're looking then essentially at behavioral baselines versus anom uh, anomalies. Okay. So the behavioral uh, baseline versus the anomalies. So I'm not sure if you can see my um, pointer. Can everybody see my pointer? Anybody? Because it's hard to do this on on um, on you this. Can see your pointer. You can see the pointer. You're fine. All right, so I can't really draw on here. I mean, I'm sure I can, but I'm not good enough to do this. But this is your baseline, okay? And what we're looking at is anomalies, things that are off the baseline that go up or down off the baseline. And these things are, are, are things that are, are, are out of character or out of normal behaviors for the person, okay? And so um, what, we're, what we're looking at then is, um, is okay, like, for example, in a school situation, you have a kid. He is in contact with teachers, parents, peers, counselors, coaches, and SROs, school resource officers. And in each one of those relationships, he has a different baseline. In other words, he acts differently with his peers than with his parents than with his teachers and with his counselors, etc. And there's a baseline that those people see every day as to, okay, what makes you Johnny you know, Johnny, what's normal, okay? And normal can be kind of weird, but still normal for the kid, and that's okay. What happens is when all of a sudden the teacher here notices that he's late. He's not asking questions like he usually does. Um, 
his homework is not as good as it usually is, or he doesn't do it. The parents are seeing, well, he's all of a sudden interested in guns. He's never been interested in guns, and now he wants my husband to bring him out to, to show him how to target practice. So you start seeing anomalies on that. The peers, uh, he starts getting angry with the peers, a little bit kind of withdrawn. Uh, he starts talking about how much he hates Mr. Jones. The peers see him look at gun magazines, things that are off. The counselors, okay, the school counselors see that, um, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, uh, acting like he's sick. He goes home sick a lot, and uh, that's unusual. The coaches see uh, a difference in behavior, and so do the police. And so what it is, it's all these anomalies, right, that if you put them all together, and you can get it from each one of these people that know this person well, that's what you use to construct your better than 50-50 so-called profile on a person that might be uh, grieved, has a grievance, is looking for is a grievance, and then you add in some of the other commonalities that we talked about. In a workplace situation, this should be workplace, not school, workplace situations, okay, your first line supervisor can, can knows the, the employee in terms of their normal behavior. Their co-workers know them in terms of their normal or baseline behavior, as well as their family, human resources, and things like this. Okay, So you can do the same thing in the workplace where you have um, these people reporting on um, anomalies. And essentially what you do on this, and this is outside of the scope of this presentation, but you put together a matrix, very similar, not too, not, not too far apart from the DSM where you look at personality disorders, you've got features, and if so many things, you matrix, matrix it out to where you have better than a 50-50 chance of, of knowing that, hey, look, this person's troubled, so let's intervene. And if we intervene, what we do is in the process of doing it through crisis intervention, trying to help them, right, and try to, because if we can fix the grievance, then we stop the shooting because they no longer have a need for revenge, which of course is simple grievance. And that's what we're trying to do. So in my research and what I do um, uh, as far as my um, consulting activities is I do this with, with companies and with schools in, in, in putting in policies and procedures in a way where you have the teachers report anomalies on their students, you have the coaches the parents, the peers, and through this training program and putting in policies and procedures in place, you actually have a, a method by which you can at least have a better than 50-50 chance of, of identifying um, a potential grieved person, whether that be a student or an uh, employee, and be able to get in front of that problem and help them deal with that grievance in a very caring way because it, it's a grievance. Um, and in, in the, in the, for the purpose of preventing um, them from carrying on with their uh, uh, their pathway to violence leading up to an act of killing. Okay, that is it in a nutshell. This is a uh, really hard to do in less than an hour, but I want to open up for any questions and pass it on to um, to uh, James Pan. Uh, well, Dr. Becky, this is Gregory. I'm actually going to uh, ask a few questions that some of our attendees have asked. Okay. Uh, the first question is, is it true or at least somewhat true that serial killers and active killers tend to lack the part of their brain where empathy would be? Well, I would probably rephrase that in, in, in terms of like, now, I wouldn't say active killers. You can't put an active killer and a serial killer in, this, in, you know, in the same bucket. They're completely different. They're not even, it's not even close. The motivation is different. Okay? But if you're talking about, um, you know, as far as that part of the brain, um, what, you're, what you're referring to would be more like for serial killers and you're dealing with someone with any social personality disorder. You know, you commonly call a psychopath a sociopath, a conduct disorder if it's less than, uh, if they're less than 18 years old, but essentially the word is actually any social personality disorder. And that is a key characteristic. It's not a damage though, it's not damage. What it is, it's a wired in personality disorder where they honestly don't understand, or not understand, they don't, first of all, they don't realize they have a disorder, right? They think there's nothing wrong with them, and they have absolutely no uh, grievance, I mean, not grievance, they have no remorse, ability to feel guilt. So if they break a pencil, they take this pen, okay, and I break this pen, or they take a person's head and they break their neck, they feel the exact same thing. 
and that's part of it being a personality disorder. So it's not so much a brain injury or missing part of the brain, um, it's a personality disorder and a very, um, a very common one because most people can't do what serial killers do, right? Most people can't do what a, um, uh, an enforcer in a gang, right? So you got a, a person who wants to join a gang and part of the, um, uh, the, the process to get in is, okay, I want you to go up to some, uh, uh, a child uh, and I want you to, 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 to cut their, uh, uh, just walk up to them arbitrarily and cut their face and walk away for their, for their uh, uh, initiation. And, you know, someone like, like us, right, who aren't serial killers and who don't have any social personality disorder, which is really the key there, right, we couldn't do it. So, you know, in gang enforcers, um, the, the, uh, the things that end up being serial killings and people that do these horrible things, like the, a lot of the terrorist killings you see over, uh, overseas uh, with ISIS and the beheadings and the tortures that they do, there is a lot of antisocial personality disorder going on um, because it kind of draws those types of people. So it's not so much of a brain uh, injury as it is, it's just a hardwired personality disorder that they can't, they can't fix. Okay. Uh, we have another question. If you intercede for the first time and you already know the individual has homicidal tendencies, then how do you stop the next time? Do you keep an active watch for the rest of their lives? Say the first part, please, again. Um, if you intercede for the first time and you already know that the individual has homicidal tendencies, then how do you stop the next time? That is, how do you stop them from acting? Do you have an active watch uh, on this individual for the rest of their lives? Well, that's kind of hard to do, but uh, yeah, that's what you would have to do because, you know, it's, um, if, you know, people, th the greatest predictor of future behavior is past behavior, mm -hmm. okay? And there's no way we can predict who is going to be the next killer or going to do the next big crime or whatever. However, there are behavioral indicators and we have to take them within context, okay? The fact that someone had a, a tendency doesn't mean they're going to carry it out. There are a lot of people that have hor horrible, violent ideations that never carry it out. You know, you have um, functional psychopaths, right, okay, who are in corporate sectors. They're in the military. They're in, the, they're in law enforcement agencies. Um, they're in school administration, and they're antisocial, but they, 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 they don't break the law, but they still ruin people's lives. So, um, so you have to... Um, to look at it from the standpoint of, of the um, uh, behavioral, uh, you do an assessment of their, uh, their background, what their, what their, um, their baselines are, and, and, and things like that. So you've got you know, you've got to look at, 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 at the whole thing, okay? So you just can't say, well, because he's got a homicidal tendency. You got, there's a whole other set of questions as to, was he actually going to carry through with it? Mm -hmm. okay? If he has in the past, then more likely he's probably going to have a tendency to do that in the future versus someone who hasn't. Okay. Uh, another question. <clears throat> have you done any research on neurological commonalities of active killers? No, but I would love to. Okay. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm really getting a huge interest in neuroscience and neuropsychology um, in, in terms of how, um, how that is related to behavior and maybe even the potential of um, identifying behavior. When I was in the behavioral science unit, we had kicked around the idea of looking at um, uh, kind of like a um, research involving you know, brain scans and things like this on known killers and unknown mm -hmm. killers and looking at the pathways and looking at um, the connections and, and, and you know, and the, and the, and the, the all the, the neural uh, cell structures and things like this in order to see, okay, is there a way that we can, you know, physically look at some of this neuroscience or this neuropsychology to see if there is some way to, to add some sort of a, a tool to our prediction model? Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to go through these as quickly as possible. Okay. Next question. What is your opinion on high-functioning psychopaths? Are these fundamentally different? Are these fundamentally different from the, the, those people with, with psychopath? Psycho, I'm trying to read this. Are these fundamentally different from those people with psychopathic traits who commit violent crimes? 
Okay. The, the short answer is no. Okay. Um, like I said, there are any social personality disorder is kind of the the, the, the clinical term for it, right? Okay, and then they got specific things like, you know, they don't believe in society, they won't follow societal standards, they're impulsive, aggressive behavior, uh, they won't be held recount, uh, accountable, um, they, have no, they have no guilt or remorse, you know, things like this. Um, you have functional psychopaths, which I call sociopaths, that, that, are, in the, uh, that are in the corporate sector, and they they, they, they uh, exhibit the exact same behavior in terms of how they treat their people, but they don't end up killing them. They, like, ruin their lives. They ruin their reputations. They, uh, they, they uh, force them out of, uh, of organizations. Uh, they, make them feel, they make them feel terrible, um, things like that. Uh, but the behavior is the same. It's just that they're not taking it to the, the next level, which is breaking the law and killing people. But essentially the behavior is the same. It's just the degree and the context of where, of where you see the behavior. So yeah, the answer is is absolutely. You can have a what we call a functional psychopath who can get along fine in society, but he ruins everybody's lives that he touches. Okay, um, there are a lot more questions, and I'm just going to go through two more because we do have more presentations uh, uh, after this. Okay. Um, how, how common is the presence of mental health, mental illness in active killers? Yes. Huge. Huge. Okay. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I, I don't, I can't put a number on it, but if you look at, um, uh, you look at any any groupings in the United States here. And I can, I'm speaking for the United States, if, uh, and you look at workplace violence and school violence, not terrorist shootings and not like profit motive. I'm talking about grievance, right? Where you have like the the bully kid or the person who didn't get the promotion and they, you know, can't deal with it and they go and they they shoot up the place and kill their boss or the postal uh, uh, attacks. Uh, in the past, where you had the postal shootings and things like that. That went on for a decade or so back in the 80s. Um, um, yeah, that's, what was the question? <laughs> I lost my, I lost my, what? The, the connection with mental illness. Yes. Almost all of those have got some sort of mental illness, either a personality disorder, a mood disorder, um, or some sort of mental illness. You'll see this um, as, a, as a factor. However, you got to be careful in, in, in saying that, you know, all shootings have mental illness and the person's got mental illness for some reason, that alone is going to make them more apt to be an active killer or active shooter. That's not true. you got to kind of look at it as just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. It's the grievance, okay, that is common for nearly all of them. Next time you look at an active shooting, right, think of yourself, Okay, where's the grievance? You know, what, what, you know, what's, what's, what's he, what's he grieved about? What, who's done him wrong from his perspective? Okay, and I guarantee, and I almost guarantee every single time he's going to have a grievance with somebody, right? And then, and he was unable to take care of that grievance. Okay, but with that, oftentimes comes some sort of mental illness. So it's prevalent. It's not in every case, but you got to again look at the grievance and the mental illness and some of these other. Uh, commonalities that we talked about in the presentation are going to be something that um, uh, you want to take into consideration as to just kind of add more to your assessment uh, to make it as accurate as you can before you identify the guy and say, hey, you know, are you, ha are you okay, right? Okay, and that's how you started out there. And then they're like, well, you know, and then you get into it. Well, if they have a grievance. They don't want to feel bad. They're, they're, they're actually thinking about killing somebody because it's so bad in their head. So now we're going to, we're going to become their, their social support mechanism. Mechanism, and once we've identified them, then we help them, and we clear the grievance. Then we essentially eliminate the motivation to shoot, and that's the beauty of this of this approach. Okay. Well, um, there are lots of other questions. However, we're going to move on uh, to Dr. James Pan, uh, and he's going to give a presentation on our forensic psychology program. So, Dr. Pan, I know, is uh, eager, willing, and waiting uh, to join us. So. Uh, let's do this. Okay, perfect. So we'll do this uh, kind of quick. Uh, Dr. Vecchi's presentation was uh, uh, fantastic and can go on for, I think, quite a, quite a while longer and still not cover all the material. It's just really not a half-hour presentation. It's kind of like a primer and just sort of get, give you an idea of the kind of stuff that we cover in our program. And actually, Dr. Vecchi t teaches a uh, uh, class in our, our, our program. Uh, that will, and we'll kind of go through some of some of those classes in just a little bit. I'm going to keep this uh, short, kind of shorten the presentation because uh, of our time. Really wanted to end at about six, but 
Right. So we have an MS in a forensic uh, psychology uh, program. And that's why I talk about the f uh, program, I mean the Master of Science in Forensic Psychology. It's a 12 credit online program, 12 course online program, 36 uh, credits to three credits uh, a course. It's uh, been going for now for, for five years and it basically covers the intersection between psychology and legal issues. And so it's about uh, how forensic psychology is used in various workplaces, various settings, various contexts. Uh, online, it's for working professionals, very you know, flexible in terms of time uh, and availability. We, uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of uh, careers growing areas within, within law enforcement, corrections, and, and our students tend to specialize in, in law, uh, mental health, and other you know, related services, uh, health services. And, they want to work uh, in some capacity in forensics, and so this gives them an opportunity to do that, uh, the, the degree. Most of our graduates will uh, continue on in some area where psychology and criminal justice intersect, uh, courts, law enforcement, criminal justice, child welfare, treatment facilities, that sort of thing. So we have students from those or in those areas. Career development, uh, getting the, moving students forward so that they can advance in terms of their careers and move towards more senior level positions with a master's degree and also make them more competitive uh, in, when uh, applying for a doctoral program meets the, uh, the requirements as well uh, for the uh, for, for like for our forensic uh, doctoral program getting this degree actually meets the prerequisites to get into the program and potentially for other progr programs as well so if you have an undergrad in an unrelated area this is a degree that can help you then uh, be uh, uh, be more competitive applying to our program clinical program. There's uh, basically eight uh, foundational uh, courses. Uh, this here's a listing of some of them. You know, your intro to, uh, course, psychopathology, evaluation, the research course, some other things. And I, you know, again, I want to kind of go through this quickly. But uh, so you can see best practices, ethics, some other courses here. We have two tracks. All right, we have uh, essentially the uh, forensic uh, psychology and the legal system track, and there's uh, four electives uh, that you can choose from. Here's a, a few of the examples, and behavioral criminology is the one that, that Dr. Becky teaches. Very fortunate to have him teach that class for us. We have uh, all sorts of faculty uh, uh, teaching classes from judges to uh, attorneys, psychologists, the, the full uh, range. The other track that we have is the is a forensic psychology for mental health uh, workers, first responders, and disaster teams. And here's a few examples of these courses. You can actually see some uh, videos that we have online on our website that speak to uh, the courses and what's uh, what's covered. So, uh, and then also some previous webinars that we've done as well. So, suicide prevention, as an example, police psychology, trauma informed assessment. There's also a capstone course at the very end. You can do a thesis or field experience if you're interested in research. Uh, the thesis can be a good uh, option for you. You know, phenomenal faculty, full time as well as adjuncts. We have a faculty like Dr. Vecchi, uh, all the way to uh, folks who work as expert witnesses, work in competency restoration, courts, higher education, of course, forensic psychologists, judge, attorney, like I said before, and our. How is our uh, how our course is taught? They're taught through a uh, Blackboard uh, in online format. We have a combination of like kind of what we're doing right now: go, go to meeting sessions, which are recorded, uh, required readings, materials that that are posted that need to be reviewed, watched, read, and uh, discussion boards that are that are done. There's assignments that are required and exams as well in order to pass the courses, receive credit for the courses. Right. It's probably the fastest I've ever done this. Let's see the. Degree, usually uh, folks are taking two classes a term, so that's six credits, right? Taking about two years to complete. At that rate, it would be two years exactly to complete. All winter and summer, three terms, right, a year. And uh, you have up to five years, so you can kind of pace yourself depending on what's, uh, what you're uh, able to do. All right. And that's it. All right, so let me uh, now turn it over to uh, back to Greg here. Thank you so much. <laughs> So, um, I 
again, we are going to be ending this presentation uh, and we're going to just quickly talk about the application process. However, please, um, if you still have questions uh, for any of us, um, we'll be able to answer the questions after my presentation. Um, so the first thing I'd like to tell you is if you love what you see uh, and you'd like to participate in our Master of Science program, um, the first thing you should do is you would apply for admission. Uh, and the screens that I'm about to show you are actually screenshots from our website. So you love our program, the first thing you'll do, you'll go ahead and apply for admission. Uh, and we welcome applications three times per year. Uh, you can apply um, uh, when you'd like to start. Um, so this uh, information on your screen shows you the online application process. Um, you would uh, complete the application. Uh, the application does require a $50 processing fee. As part of the application process, we require two letters of recommendation. Um, these are from individuals who are familiar with you as a person. Um, we prefer individuals who know you in an academic uh, capacity. And it's really for them to tell us uh, to provide their information concerning how well you will perform in graduate school. Um, we require you to submit official transcripts. Uh, the emphasis is placed on your uh, junior and senior grades. Um, we would like students to have a minimum of a 3.0 or better for admission. Um, if, if you've attended more than one school, um, we do require that you submit your transcripts from all the schools that you've attended. Um, as part of the application process, we'd like you to tell us more about yourself, uh, essentially why you're interested in the program and how this program uh, will satisfy your professional or personal goals. Uh, and this statement uh, should be at least 500 words long. Um, again, we admit students or welcome students into our program uh, three times per year. Uh, the terms are listed as well as the deadline date. Uh, the deadline date means that you would submit all the required documents on or before those dates. Um, if you're an international student, the process is slightly different, uh, and so we strongly recommend that you contact us or you can go to the Office of International uh, Students and Scholars for more information. Um, our application or ma mailing address is located on the screen. Um, we also give students the opportunity to send us their electronic transcripts uh, to expedite the process. As part of uh, attending school, uh, many of you will have questions concerning affordability. Um, and what I can tell you is that we have a fantastic department available to help you uh, in this process. Um, it's called the Office of Student Financial Assistance, uh, and their website is located on the screen. Um, we offer um, uh, funding for students uh, in the categories of scholarships, uh, grants, uh, student employment, uh, veterans benefits, loans, uh, and payment plans. Um, you have the ability of either contacting us via mail, um, emailing us, or visiting us on campus to sit down and talk to someone about the process. Uh, again, if you do have any questions about the program, uh, Dr. Pans uh, is a great person to contact, and his contact information is on the screen. So with that said, um, we do have lots of questions, uh, and so I invite both Dr. Becky and Dr. Pan to return uh, online to uh, answer questions. Hello. This is Dr. Vecchi. Unfortunately, I have to leave in about five minutes. Okay. Um, well, let me um, just uh, ask, ask a few more questions. Um, one second. Um, many individuals have asked about um, uh, this presentation. Um, one second. Uh, one person asked about uh, the predictability. Can we write up a matrix or a 
computerized process that could connect the dots um, along the time it takes to use social media uh, to help to predict a possible uh, action or would this be an invasion of privacy? Well, I don't think that looking at social media or doing some sort of algorithm with social media is going to um, be able to, to, to be specific enough to identify um, a specific person. You, you've actually got to have people that actually know him or her and deal with this person on a regular basis. That might be a piece of it, mm -hmm. but, but remember that, um, you know, you know. I say you have a a, 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 a kid that's in school, let's say like in, you know, a junior in, in high school or something like this, and he feels grieved to say he's bullied, and he's tried to he's tried to deal with it, and he's been unable to deal with it, so he decides, okay, look, I'm going to take matters in my own hands. Um, and 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 when he when he starts going through that pathway of violence, he starts to do many of these behaviors that are that are counter or or an anomaly or different than what they usually do. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to the people that know him best to be trained and have a process for reporting those anomalies. And then you have to have someone with the background and expertise to put this in some sort of a matrix. Now, you certainly could, you know, at a come up with some sort of like a computer program where you could put in these various behaviors to get an idea of uh, of a person that may be, um, you know, uh, grieved and, and thinking of, and planning to do something that's potentially violent. What you can't get in is is is, is uh, cry wolf all the time and say, okay, well. Uh, you know, this, these, these people are, this person uh, is exhibiting these behaviors, and it turns out he's not thinking about shooting anybody at all. It's just that, you know, because you're, you're, you're making an assumption based on one or two anomalies instead of looking at it through the various windows of his life, the windows that he has with his behavior, with his parents, the teachers, the coaches, all the various people that see him in a different manner because everybody who um, is involved with these, you know, a kid that's involved with all these people, you have like a social desirability and what we do with social desirability, we want, pe we want people to view us in a certain manner and that becomes our normal behavior with them. So the, so a kid might be outrageous, might be kind of goth and outrageous and kind of crazy with his peers and be completely different with his parents or with his teachers. But that's normal behavior in those contexts. And so you've got to be able to look at the, the, the anomalies in each one of those subcontexts in order to look at a bigger pattern and a bigger picture that will give you an indication that, you know, he's, he, there, there, there's enough of these behaviors. It's just like when you try to do a, a determine a personality disorder, right? You got a psychologist or mental health professional. They have a, the DSM. The DSM, say, say, say like for antisocial or for narcissism or something, um, you have to display these behaviors and this certain amount of behaviors over a period of time in order for you to be diagnosed with that disorder. Other than that, you can't be diagnosed with the disorder. You can only be uh, the best you can say is they have features of that disorder, but they now have a full-blown diagnosis, therefore you can't do a prognosis, therefore you can't do a treatment plan. Well, it's the same way with this. If you don't have enough um, of behaviors and anomalies from, from enough different types of contexts, you know, the, you know like, like teachers and the various people that he deals with, the groups of people he deals with in his life, um, then you can't, then it's hard to make a prediction. But if you have enough behaviors, uh, enough anomalies over enough uh, of different contexts, then you can actually put it together very similar to how you would do it with someone uh, via the, the DSM manual and are, are trying to make a diagnosis on any, personal, any, any social personality disorder or some other, you know, uh, you know, mood disorder, bipolar, whatever. And you could, you could do it that way uh, with, the, uh, with, with this method. Um, but the answer to the question is, you know, just looking at social media, that might be just only one piece. But the question is, you got to say, well, is this an anomaly or is this, is this uh, you know, what context is this? Is context in social media, that's for the world to see, and I don't think it's, it has enough specificity speci to, to, to do that, if that, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, we seem to have a lot more questions, and um, in the interest of time, is there a way, are you um, uh, <clears throat> receptive to us sending you uh, several of these questions um, for yes. your answers? Yes, no problem. Happy to do it. Wonderful, good. 
Well, thank you so much um, for sharing this uh, wonderful information. I know, I know I learned a lot about this, and hopefully um, uh, this has inspired us to uh, learn more about the subject. So, well, good. Well, I appreciate yeah. the opportunity. I really do. It was really, I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, with that said, um, everyone, thank you so much. Um, we're going to be ending uh, this presentation.